Sunday the 5th of July 2020. Welcome to this act of worship from the Butts Church, Alton. The church is an independent evangelical church that seeks to base all that it does on the Bible's clear teaching. So it is at the centre of all that we seek to do. So in this service of worship today, you will find that we include what we believe the Bible tells us to do, singing songs and hymns of worship to God, prayers, that is talking to God, reading from the Bible where God speaks to us, an item for the young people, and then a sermon. What does the Bible mean? What does it mean for today? And how should we implement its teaching? So we pray that as we gather together, you will be blessed by God himself. So as we begin our act of worship, we do so. We're singing a hymn of praise to Almighty God. Oh 
Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna. now come to speak to God in prayer. Let us all pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you for the wonderful life that you have given to us all. We thank you that you are the creator of all things. We thank you for your love for the universe and for humankind. And we pray that you would indeed help us to rejoice in your goodness to us. We thank you for the earth in which we live and we apologise for the, the mess that at times we make of it but we thank you that new every morning are your mercies as the sun comes up and illuminates your glorious creation. Again we can see your loving kindness. And we thank you that you have inspired so many people, not least inspired those who composed the words in the Bible, inspired those who brought it together and have printed it so that we can read it in our own words. And we just pray that as we read and think about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of us all, who put our trust in him, that we may be able to rejoice in you. We thank you for the work of God, the Holy Spirit, entering the life of a believer and making these things known to us. And so we ask today, O Lord, that as we are gathered, that you would indeed accept our praise and worship that we bring to you. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you gave to us a prayer, normally called the Lord's Prayer, but we call it the Disciples' Prayer, because Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, saying together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now it is lovely that Jacob has something for us. Thank you, Jacob. So this is my third week of being part of the church service. And I would just like to thank you, everyone, for letting me be part of um, being part of the church service and for um, thanking me um, by sending um, messages of support and um, and yeah and for enjoying the video um, thank you so this week's theme is um, animals and I instantly thought cats what comes to your mind instantly when someone says animal so in the Bible there is loads of chapters that contain animals the first ever verse that shows animals in the Bible I believe is um, in Genesis Chapter 1, verse 20. Then God said, Let the water be filled with many living things, and let there be birds um, to fly over earth. And right near the very beginning of the Bible, that their um, animals are included. That shows that animals are a very important part of God's creation. So, our clip is something that you will be able to guess easily. We, we are going to do a recreation of Noah's Ark. You probably all know that one, but I'll let this be a recap. When Jungle Joe was younger, he always wanted to be a zookeeper, so he set off to be one. He wanted to collect two of every animal for his zoo. And it wasn't long before he found his first animal. He found two very friendly lions that clambered in. Then he set off to find some more animals. 
as he found two very friendly cats who jumped in straight away. Jungle Joe had a very busy day collecting animals. Here are some of the animals that he found. Soon it started to snow very, very heavily and the car got stuck in the snow. So a penguin went off to find some dry land. When he found some, he rushed back to his friends to tell them the good news. When he got there, he found out that they had managed to free the van, so they drew, drove off to the dry land. The end. So as we all know, Noah was told by God to build an ark and to have two of every animal. Now, now that I'm a bit older and I've um, realised how many animals there actually is in the world and were as some are extinct, that blows my mind how many animals actually were in the ark. It must mean a pretty big ark and a pretty smelly ark. God created animals all for a reason. Otherwise, why would he have created them? For example, does anyone know what a worm does? I found this from the web. Worms help to increase the amount of air and water that gets into the soil. They break down organic matter like leaves and grass into things that plants can use. When they eat, they leave behind castings that are very valuable type of fertilizer. Earthworms are like free farm help. About wasps. Everybody finds wasps annoying, but what are they actually for? Well, wasps are also just important in the environment. Social wasps are predators and as such they play a vital ecological role and um, um, controlling the number of um, potential pests like green fly and many caterpillars. How about spiders? I know that there's some spider haters out there. Um, so, um, spiders hunt and capture prey. The majority feed on other insects and other invertebrate, invertebrates, um, but some of the largest spiders may prey on vertebrates such as birds. Basically, most of the animals are around to keep the number of um, other species down, e.g. spiders and wasps. When you look around and you see the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and all the other la animals that live on land, just remember that they were part of God's amazing creation and they are here to live among us. See you next week. So we thank Jacob for what he has uh, brought to us and uh, his great skill in what he does and we are so thankful to him. We're now going to come and pray together again. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, as we bow before you in prayer, we pray for the world today. We realise that in many places COVID-19 has been causing such devastation. We thank you for the great skill of scientists and of doctors, of nurses, ancillary workers. Lord, we just bless you for them. And we just ask that you would indeed um, be pleased to bring an end to this terrible time. But we realise that our times are in your hands. But we also pray for those areas of the world that may have been forgotten about. We think especially of East Africa, where a number of countries are still suffering devastation caused by locust swarms. As those of us living here in the United Kingdom cannot really imagine 
the horror, unless we've been in such a situation, of what locusts can do. How it devastates the food chain and brings food shortage to many people. Oh Lord, we just pray that you would be with those countries who are suffering and all other countries that are suffering in different ways. Not just from famine, but also from flood, also from drought. Lord, have mercy on them. And we think very particularly of the Yemen, a country that has suffered so much. And for the huge numbers of people who are starving, we just pray that you would indeed enable the agencies to help those who are in such need. And we also think of the Middle East, especially Syria and Iraq, as there has been this resurgent of Islamic State, Daesh. Lord, we just ask that you would restrain the hands of evil men and women. We realise that Islamic State has rejoiced in COVID-19, calling it God's little soldier, because the world is deflected by other concerns and so they are able to gain a foothold. But we pray against such evil. Lord, have mercy in our generation. We also thank you for the police and the fire services. Thank you for the way they seek to maintain order and help in times of distress. We just pray for them today. We also ask for members of the armed forces serving at home and abroad that you would be with them and that you would bless them. But particularly we thank you for the work of the National Health Service, for all who are involved in it. We do not realise what a, a blessing it is to us until uh, such problems come that cause us to suffer. But we thank you for all who do all they can to alleviate our problems. And as a church fellowship in Alton, we give you a special thanks for Pastor Ben. We thank you for all the work he has been doing and uh, will undoubtedly, in your goodness, continue to do amongst us. And we just pray that you would be with him and Anne as they have these two weeks off. We realise it's unusual in that they won't be able to get away as they hope to, but we just nonetheless pray a great blessing will be upon them. Now, as this service has been recorded, um, and who knows, as we come to Sunday, uh, what is in the news, it will be good now to have a time of silence where we can bring personal as well as national or international needs before God in prayer. So for a few moments in silence, let us pray to God. Lord, we ask that in your mercy, you would hear all these our prayers. And we think today, especially of all those for whom life's journey will end today either suddenly or unexpected or expected. Whoever they are, Lord, we just pray that they may indeed be those who know you, that as they enter eternity, that you would be gracious to them. But we also pray for families and friends who will either receive sudden or shocking news or news that has been expected, we just ask that you would indeed be gracious to each and every one of them. And so we thank you that we can speak to you in prayer wherever we are, at whatever time, and we present these our prayers to you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now Amanda is going to bring to us a reading from Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3 verses 1 to 13. God's marvellous plan for the Gentiles. For this reason, 
I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the Gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and share us together in the promise in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace, given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. So in our journey and through the book of Ephesians, we come this morning to the uh, first 13 verses of chapter 3, which I've entitled, Tis Mystery All. Um, I got the idea of the title from a great hymn that we will conclude with, words by Charles Wesley. Tis mystery all. Seven times in the letter to the Ephesians, Paul uses the word mystery. Four in our passage today. Now many mysteries abound, and those who uh, uh, received this letter back there in the first century may have questioned What was going on? The mystery, as verse 1 tells us, of Paul, who is a prisoner, a prisoner of Jesus Christ for the sake of the Gentiles, but also someone in prison. It must have been very mysterious indeed, because they would undoubtedly have heard of the power of God and maybe witnessed the power of God in different situations. I think they probably would have heard of another apostle called Peter who was imprisoned in Jerusalem, but released by an angel, a supernatural intervention. And then when he goes back to the home where the Christians are praying and knocks on the door, um, people don't believe that God has actually answered prayer. I trust we are not like that. We pray believing that God can and will and does, in his time, answer prayer. And so it was that here, these people in Ephesus... Uh, which is in modern-day Turkey today, would have uh, heard this story coming from Jerusalem, this account, and wondered why is it that Paul, a great apostle as well, um, is left in prison, not released by God's angel. Well, God's ways are not our ways. Uh, We can see that very clearly in our lives at the moment. And although Paul had a great ministry, travelling around to speak to the Gentiles, he is the apostle to the Gentiles, this great missionary endeavour of his. The Ephesians could never imagine how Paul, being imprisoned, had time to write this letter that we have in front of us that has been used ever since it was first delivered all over the world to the blessing of many. So in prison, he was free. He was free to write, and to write clearly, inspired by God the Holy Spirit, that has come through time and space, and we have it today. The mystery of God's providence should never be doubted. It's a very difficult thing for us. It's an imperfect illustration, but someone once said, imagine, say, a game of chess. 
um, that there are the two players and there's the chess pieces and they're wondering what is going on if they have minds why have you moved me here well hopefully if the player is half decent they would have reasoned that that is the best place to put the piece even though the chess piece itself could not see why they haven't got the overall view well God has the overall view of life and eternity and the mystery of his providence is that he works all things according to his will and he knows what he is doing even though we may be tempted and I hope that it's not very often we do this but we may be tempted to question him so right now you may be restricted many people are but if that's the case who knows the plan of God for your life what is he going to do with you and for you and how are you going to be a blessing to others how much greater can be your influence and blessing if you are restricted right now through your prayers, maybe through letters, email, Facebook, whatever it may be, or in uh, going online to speak to others. Um, do not minimise this time that God has given to us. We often complained before lockdown came about we don't seem to have enough time. And now people are saying, we've got too much time. Well, let's use it positively, if we are Christians, to be a blessing to others and to pray as well. We have this opportunity of praying for countries, for people, for situations. We have time to watch the news and as the news items come up, we can pray. Lord, bless this one or the other. And we thank you that we do get times of great rejoicing like that little boy who has just raised a million pounds how astonishing that was who had been treated so fearfully he has now been used to bless others in the hospital so let us use our time the time that God has given to us the time we will never have again uh, positively and productively we are living through strange times though and there is this Great temptation to say, well, why has God allowed this? Why has he prolonged this um, terrible virus? Well, it is a mystery. It is a great mystery. And God, who is Lord of all, mighty and powerful, allows these things to take place, both to teach us lessons and to cause people to rely on him and come to him. Many mysteries, of course, exist in the world today. We would be foolish to deny them. There is the mystery of God himself and uh, all that's connected with him. There is the mystery of life. What is life? Um, how strange it is that one moment someone can be very alive and the next moment life has left them. The mystery of Christian salvation. How is it it works? how is it that God has selected us of course there is the great mystery of death itself what will happen where do we go and in many ways we will only answer those questions when our time comes to pass away and then the Bible's teaching on everlasting life what is that like why is it we should aspire to it? Why did God send his son into the world, not only to free us from our sin, but also to give us hope for the future? Mystery upon mystery. And the Bible is very clear in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, where it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that they may follow all the words of the Lord. So we take on board what is said there, that we're not going to know everything. Indeed, only God can know everything, because only he has the uh, intellect suitable to understand what is going on. But it doesn't stop people from inquiring. Countless numbers through the ages have strived to discover things. Now that is right and good and we are very blessed today by all those things that have been discovered. 
some people say to me um, about the Christian faith. How is it that Jesus dying 2,000 years ago can have a positive effect on my life today? Well, I, like undoubtedly others of you, take medication. And uh, some of the medication I take, it was actually discovered many long years ago. But just because it was discovered long years ago, hasn't stopped it being effective today for me. And so it is with Jesus. His death, all that time ago, is very effective for all who will come to him in repentance and faith today. And so we are to be those who give thanks for all that has been discovered, all the different initiatives that have taken place, like the initiative we're using right now. If COVID had happened, say, 20 years ago, it would have been very difficult to meet up with people, even through this means, because it hadn't been discovered and existed. So we rejoice in it. And I trust that we think positively of these times. But also, human beings being naturally curious, as ever, will go beyond what they should. It's like if you have a change of the law, if you, whatever it may be, if you move, as it were, the, the, the fence a little bit, people say thank you very much for altering something, but then they want to push it even further. We're like that. We keep going beyond the acceptable boundaries if we're not careful. Now, Paul was given insight into the grace, that is, the mercy of God, uh, the mystery that has been made known to him, as verses 2 and 3 say, that there is the mystery of God made known to us. Now, if God had not made known that mystery to the Apostle Paul, he wouldn't have had a tiny clue as to what was going on. He may have uh, made an assumption, and it would have been very wrong indeed. And we find this throughout the Bible, which is divided into two bits. There's um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, 39 books in the Old Testament that go from Genesis to Malachi and uh, 27 in the New Testament that go from Matthew to Revelation. And we find that in the Old Testament, the earlier part of the Bible, uh, the Jewish people who had been released from slavery in Egypt, as they were led out towards the promised land, um, through Moses, they were given many instructions. And in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 9 to 15, there is this extended instruction. Do not go beyond what I tell you you can accept. So we read, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same, same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. Very profound words in Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 15. And of course, it speaks there of a prophet greater than Moses. And it's quoted in the New Testament part of the Bible when uh, people kept saying of Jesus, is this the prophet? And of course, these detestable ways are the reason why God uh, caused the Israelites to act in the way they did. In limited ways, it was not ethnic cleansing, but it was a cleansing of the land from detestable practices. Could you imagine your young son or daughter whom you have just 
gone through the whole process of birth and and brought into this world is then handed her to a priest to throw into a fire. How astonishing that would have been. How wicked, how detestable, as it says here. And so these things are put as blocks. Do not do them. Do not copy them. Do not follow them, says God. Now, Ephesus was one of the most sophisticated cities in the ancient Near East. And we find that many of these practices, unfortunately, had come there. Ephesus was a commercial, a political, a religious centre of Western Asia. Those living there would have been familiar with what were called the mystery religions. And a large amount of people followed them, but also, maybe surprisingly for some of us to learn, there was a large amount of scepticism as well. There was a great deal of atheism. Um, people didn't believe that the gods either existed or could help them, but they just went almost like a good luck sign to uh, go along and give uh, the odd offering at a temple. Now, if you were to visit the ancient site of Ephesus today, you go through the top entrance and to the left hand side is located the ruins of a, a temple to the Isis, the Egyptian goddess of magic. Now, whenever I've been privileged to lead a group there, I've tried to encourage people to come and look at the remains. But I often find that I say this is fascinating. People glance over, see a pile of stones and then do not follow me. So I'm educating myself again. Um, she was one of the most powerful of all the Egyptian deities, it was believed, because she was a clever trickster. Empowered by her magic and feminine wiles, rather than her logic or strength, um, she became very famous, and in all the places that we are told about in the Acts of the Apostles that Paul visited, there was a temple to Isis there, and there were her followers. Interestingly, from the 3rd to the 5th century, sometime in that uh, period, the popular motif of Isis suckling her son Horus was Christianized, and it's become the famous image of Mary suckling the infant Jesus. If you look at two, and you can do it online very quickly, look at two images of um, Isis and Horus and then Mary and Jesus, you will see how similar they are. She was also heavily linked with the goddess Artemis, Diana of the Ephesians, who was, whose temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's just outside of the um, ancient city, but uh, there's not much of it left today. One of the columns of the temple from that great uh, structure, uh, and it is virtually all that is left of the original 36 sculptured columns of the 130 that were there um, is in the British Museum and uh, the Apostle Paul would have seen it and you can see it today when the museum is back open. Now in this city Paul's preaching threatened the business of the craftsmen who made um, replicas of the great statue um, of Artemis. Uh, they made household idols and because he was causing them a lack of business. A riot followed, as recorded for us in the New Testament in the Acts chapter 19, verses 21 to 24. Diana is the Latin name of the goddess known in Greek mythology as Artemis. And under the um, site of St Paul's Cathedral in London, there is the remains of a uh, temple to Diana. She was the patroness of childbirth and the Amazons, the tribe of women who lived apart from men. She's also considered the protectoress of little children and all suckling animals. Artemis remained a perpetual virgin, though she symbolised fertility, similar to what people think about the Virgin Mary today. She was revered as the moon goddess, she was a great hunter and is often portrayed with packs of hunting dogs um, surrounding her. Now, you may just about see this. 
It's a little uh, model of a statue that is in Ephesus of Artemis and around her there's lots of animals and on her arms there is a lion either side and because it was considered the most powerful animal that there was and because of her link to fertility these lumps here have been identified as bull's testicles so the bull that great animal and uh, she was the one who supervised him now she was a uh, an animal who, uh, she was a, a, sorry, a goddess who took care of animals and for this reason her temple became the centre of a lucrative tourist industry. It rivalled the Parthenon in Athens for size and fame. And Paul very deliberately here in this letter to the Ephesians contrasts the false claims about her with the truth about the mystery of Christ. Verse 4. That unlike those who followed her, uh, Jesus is for all people, Jews and Gentiles alike. So Jesus is not a deity limited to an area or to a region, but uh, he is for all people. So that all can share in the mystery of the promise in Christ, as we have it here in verse 6. How glorious this is, all together. Not just an elite group, or not just for the riffraff, but for everybody, wherever you are. Now the worship conducted in Artemis' temple uh, was idolatrous. Many craving favours from the goddess, who had supposedly fallen from heaven, as Acts 19 verse 35 tells us. And Paul's preaching and teaching tells people that Jesus had not fallen from heaven, but graciously come down from heaven to lift people up. Now his preaching caused mass hysteria and frenzy, and that caused a great demonstration, and you can still visit the remains of the uh, theatre today uh, in Ephesus, where people gathered and were shouting out against him. Uh, two called Aristarchus and Gaius, were rushed into the theatre, but Paul was kept out. And violence was associated with her. So much so that before this time, uh, in her temple, Cleopatra, the famous Cleopatra, her si sister called Arsinoe, had gone looking for sanctuary, something that became familiar in churches in this country much later on. Um, but she was dragged out and murdered on the orders of Mark Antony. She was buried at Ephesus, possibly in what's known as the Octagon, an imposing city centre tomb, and the remains of a young woman were discovered there. And if you go online and put in Arsenui, you can see um, the replica face, the face of probably of Queen Cleopatra, uh, of this young woman. Artemis had fallen down from heaven, and she's compared to Christ who through the mystery now made known is shown arriving in a right and proper way, coming forward. So the church, unlike those in the temple of old, are able to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, verses 10 and 11. She had come down not to go back, but Jesus had come down and he would go back. Now, there were many um, people who followed different ways of mystery religions. Um, you can still get a book to do called the Hermetica. You might just see that, the lost wisdom of the pharaohs. And it can conflates, really, um, Hermes, the, the messenger, along with Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom and writing. And it's you read it and it just doesn't make sense compared to the Bible, which is so clear. And so instead of mysticism or mistiness, instead of a, a vague theory or you're surrounded by mist or fog, we have the full-blown revelation of the eternal purposes of God accomplished through Jesus Christ the Lord. So it's not just for acolytes or special people, but for all who will confess their sins and receive the gift of life eternal through Jesus Christ. 
And this is an incredible thing to consider. It means that for now and forever, we can approach God with freedom and confidence. We see that in verse 12 of chapter 3. Aren't those two fabulous things? Freedom. We are free. We are not bogged down. We are able to come with confidence to God through the Lord Jesus. Because Jesus has won a great victory on the cross. Now we are in July. There's a couple of very special dates that we've just had. The 1st of July reminds us of the awful events um, in 1916 on the Somme where so many soldiers lost their lives and uh, they lost their lives to gain a type of freedom for us but not compared with the freedom that Jesus brings us and then a couple of days uh, yesterday wasn't it the 4th of July um, Independence Day well Jesus has given us total independence in himself to come to God in freedom and confidence. So we can benefit from and glory in together, if we trust in him, what he has achieved. Now, Ben, when he was teaching from uh, Ephesians 2, uh, we read there about e Ephesians 2 verse 2, that Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And so he roams about in his kingdom. In Job chapter 1 and verse 7 in the Old Testament, when there was a meeting in heaven and Satan joined it, uh, God said to Satan, where have you come from? And he doesn't say I've come from hell. He says I've come from roaming to and fro over the earth. So in the kingdom of the air. But Jesus is victorious, a far greater victory than the Allies won in the First World War. And that victory that Jesus won is shown in his ascension. It may be obvious, but we may not have thought of it. Where did Jesus go when he ascended? Well, he went up through the air. He went up through Satan's kingdom to show that Satan could not shackle him, could not restrain him, could not stop him. And we're told that Jesus is going to come again and all who love him will meet him. Where? in the air what satan claims to be his kingdom all of god's beloved people will meet him in the air so there is no restrictions on flying then as 1 thessalonians 4 tells us and so in the glorious future that is coming it is a mystery because we don't fully understand it but it will be revealed we will have new bodies we will be in a new place. We will have new horizons with one another. No wonder Charles Wesley wrote, "'Tis mystery all." But don't doubt God. Rejoice in him and in his superlative generosity to his people. Paul's imprisonment in verse 1 of this chapter is a mystery, as is life. But if we look away from our troubles, if we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face, the things of earth do grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious grace. We will see, confusing though things may be, that Jesus has the answer that we need. He is in control. He has the best in store for his people. So I love what we have in verse 13. I ask you therefore... Do not be discouraged. Friends, we live in interesting days, but don't be discouraged. Look to Jesus, come to him, give your life to him, follow him, for he will indeed answer your basic need. Thanks be to God. And we're now going to sing a hymn together.
die for me. Amazing, amazing love, love. how can how it, can be? it be that thou, thou, my God, should die for me? words we have just sung in that hymn by Charles Wesley and now we come to our closing prayer words from Ephesians 3 now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations 
for ever and ever. And shall we say together, Amen. The Butts Church will be meeting together again at 6.30 this afternoon. Details are on the church calendar and we will be looking together at 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 to 12. Uh, a, a time of a brief explanation and then we're going to open it up to see how those words can help us in our daily Christian life. I look forward to seeing you then but if not may God bless you in as we go into this new week. Amen.